familiar with this story. I'm sure it's kind of sensational, which, as far as I'm concerned, everything Jesus did was sensational because, well, we'll find out as we go that this story that happened to him and his disciples is in a very unusual part of the country. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Let's read verses 1 down to verse 20. And I entitled this, for lack of a better title, The Thirteenth Disciple. We'll see why. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Some translations say Gerasene. And when he had come out of the boat, and talking about Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus Son of the Most High God, I implore you, my God, that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine, that's pigs, hogs, was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. <coughs> so those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, what a great story as it illustrates one more time for us how great your power is over the powers of darkness. And Lord, what a dark world do we live in. The powers of darkness are everywhere. And we realize that Jesus told his disciples, you are lights. I send you out as lights into the world, into a dark world. And we are to carry that light wherever we go. Help us do that but help us as we examine this story that you might speak to us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This story happened, and some of the details are in the actual text, but in a strange area of the country. Uh, we must remember that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the man in this story was definitely Mark includes a lot of detail, and that makes this story come to life because of these details. And of course, Mark, being a Jew, would include the casting of the demons in the swine or pigs because the Jews did not eat pork of any kind or variety. They considered them unclean, for God had told them so. A lot of people don't eat pork today because the Bible says in the Old Testament not to. Why is that? Well, it has to do with ceremony or the ceremonial law. For this was another way in which the Jews were to remain distanced 
from pagan people. We talk about social distancing today. It's not new. It's very old. It has been here a very long time. The people of God were not to associate with pagans because you know in the Old Testament we're told time and time again that rather than the people of God bringing others to God, they were notorious for adopting the pagan religion rather. The Old Testament account shows us that clearly. And I would say Christians today are not much different because we often adopt the ideas of society rather than trying to reach them with the gospel. There are many lessons in this account by Mark. Many. One of these lessons shows us the lack of faith by men when it comes to believing in Jesus as the Savior, as the God of the universe. You remember the disciples had just been rebuked by Jesus for not for having no faith. Now the townspeople in this story ask Jesus to leave their region for fear of what happens to this demon-possessed man. So let's get into the story. And I think as we work our way through it, all kinds of application will arise as we go. So let's focus our attention on Jesus rather than the man because this will help us see this whole thing from the divine perspective. There are five actions by Jesus in this account that will help us see just how deep sin goes in every person. I pray this will help us to love our Savior more than ever. The first action is in verses 1 to 5. Jesus sees a man who had lost much of the image of God. Jesus sees a man who had lost much of the image of God. Let that sink in just a moment. We are told in the very first book of the Bible that all men are made in the image of God. And this means at least two things. There is the immaterial part and there is the material part. The immaterial part is we all have intelligence. But if I go to you and ask you, let me hold your intelligence, you can't take it out and put it in my hands. It's immaterial. We all have will. I can't ask you to let me see your will. I can see how you act, but I cannot see your will. We all have emotions. But if I ask you to put love in my hand, you can't do that. It is an immaterial emotion that shows itself when something happens. So that's the immaterial part, but then there's the material part. And this I want you to just imagine what God meant when he said, let us make man in our image. In some ways, and I had to come to grips with this years ago, we resemble our creator. When God looks at us, he sees some of himself in every person that's ever been created. In some men, that image is distorted, twisted. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The person you see in the mirror is not who I'm talking about. Much like the man in this story. God made us in his image. And I think when God sees that image of himself in you and me, it brings joy to his heart. When he doesn't, it brings sadness. And Jesus looks at this man who runs to him and says, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to restore the image of God in this man. We'll get to that. But consider what this man had lost. Right here in the text, it tells us Number one, he had lost his dwelling with other men. He lived in the cemetery. I'm sure that probably just makes you want to go move there, doesn't it? He lived in the cemetery. Many thought during this time that cemeteries were where demons and evil spirits lived. And even today, 
People are afraid to go to a cemetery after dark. You don't have night funerals. They're always during the day. So this is where the man lived, and he lived by himself. There was no one there except dead people. He had only lost, not only lost his dwelling with other men, he had lost his normal strength. What do I mean by that? He had supernatural strength. This came from those who lived in him. I want to tell you, as your pastor, never think that demons are not strong. They are supernatural beings. Scripture verifies this very clearly. One story that's always captured my attention is in Acts 19, verses 15 and 16. Seven sons of a man named Sceva said, we're going to start casting out demons in the name of Jesus and Paul. They weren't even followers of Paul's teaching or of Jesus the Messiah. So they began to do that and obviously had some success until they came upon a particular evil spirit. And beginning in verse 15, when they tried to cast him out, this is what the evil spirit said. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Jesus even calls the devil the strong man in Mark chapter 3, verse 27. So this man had lost his normal strength. And then, number three, he had lost his normal mind. He could not be tamed, or probably a better idea, he could not be civilized. Maybe you've known people that were very uncivilized, but I'm talking, this takes it to a whole other level. When chained up, he had broken the chains. This is a man who was totally overtaken by evil, and when that happens, the evil spirit defaces the image of God. We are then beyond the help of any man. Did you hear what I said? Psychiatrists and psychologists, or whatever you want to call them, what would have happened if a modern psychologist or psychiatrist had cured this man? I'll tell you what they would do. They would put him in a rubber room. Because they could do nothing to help him. They would try to get into his subconscious mind and find out what happened a long time ago. Did his mother not hold him enough, or was it some other, did his father leave at an early age? They could do nothing to help him. They could only keep him from hurting himself or others. And that is because they leave the master out of their thinking. I have a book in my library written by a former psychiatrist called Psychobabble. And in that book, he talks about one of the people in one of the patients in the ward where he worked that people had been dealing with for 15 years and had seen no change. This man became a Christian. And he said, one time this fellow asked me about the meaning of life, and I began to share with him about what Jesus Christ had done for himself. The fellow believed what he said about Jesus. And the man who managed the whole wing came to him and said, you can't talk about religion. You can't talk about things like that. Do you know why? Because we won't get paid if people get treated and can go home. How many people are beyond the help of any man word from the master changes all of that. And then number four, he lost his sense of well-being. The scripture says he could be heard crying out day and night. He cut himself with stones. Why? That's a good question, isn't it? What about these young women today who cut themselves? What are they 
trying to do them. We don't live back in the dark ages where they thought if you bled a person a little bit, that would get rid of disease. That's not what they're trying to do. And I don't believe it has anything to do with normalcy. It has something to do with the evil that is in them. Demonic possession causes the possessed one to do what? To take their own life, if at all possible. That's what the devil wants. He doesn't want to use you like a pawn on a chessboard. He wants you to die. That's what he wants. What did Jesus say? He came to kill, destroy. That's his job. And for people who want to tamper around with this kind of thing, how serious they don't realize this is. But I've spent enough time with the bad news. Let's get to the good news. Number two, Jesus speaks to this man in verses 6 to 10. The order of the speaking is reversed. We don't know why, and that's okay. The man runs to Jesus. Notice what it says. He saw him from afar. For those of you not from the south, that means from a long ways off. And ran to him and falls down before him. The word is the same as used in many other places in scripture for worship. No doubt the demons recognized Jesus for who he was. And notice there is a, there is a difference in how this man speaks to Jesus. He speaks to him in the singular. Why are you here to torment me? Basically, can't you just leave me alone? For Jesus had already told the evil spirit to come out. The spirit knows who Jesus is. And you think about that. He knows who Jesus is. But Jesus says, what is your name? Who am I dealing with? Legion, for we are many. Now, if you don't know what a legion, a legionnaire is, that is a person over six thousand troops. Now we don't know for sure there was six thousand, but there was a lot. All we know there were many in this man. And Jesus looks upon him and sees a man who had defaced the image of God in himself by allowing evil. Now let me ask you, do you do the same thing? You say, what are you talking about? Of course not. Are you letting evil come into your home? You know exactly where I'm going with this, don't you? By what you watch on TV? Would you let that person come into your house? Would you let them use that language in your presence? Then why are you watching? kick myself sometimes for what some of the things I watch or by what we read or by what we listen to you see the devil does not need a door that is wide open all he needs is a crack yeah, yeah. that's all he needs a small opening I have to take time Every once in a while, I don't have any set time but to do some house cleaning in my own heart. Because over a period of time, we, we, we relax our guard and we let things in, things slip in, and we must throw them out. That is why the apostle said this in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? So Jesus speaks to this man and it's a very unusual and enlightening conversation. And then number three, Jesus allows the demons to depart in verses 11 to 13. Hogs are feeding nearby. So this tells us something Either one of two things. Number one, either this was a pagan group or they were Jews, and that is possible, who took care of hogs to sell them to pagan people. I kind of go with the first. 
even though the text really does not say, we believe that most of those who lived in this area were Gentiles rather than Jews. But no matter, the scripture says there were hogs feeding close by. And the demons request that they be cast into the swine. And the scripture says Jesus permitted them or allows them. And it gives us the number. Is that important? Of course it is. 2,000 hogs. Now, if that's one demon per hog, then you know how many there were. It may not have been. We do not know. If all of those could be in one person, then it could have been three times that or ten times that. But anyway, the demons enter the hogs. Now, I don't know if you know much about hogs other than what you cook on in the morning when you put bacon in the pan, and that's fine. But hogs do not have a strong sense of self-preservation as do humans. This man is an example of this. He cut himself, cried out, but he never killed himself or attempted to, obviously. So this man is an example of this. He never allowed the demons to take his life. In other words, he had basically drawn a line in the sand and said, you can have all of me, but you can't have this one. That's exactly what happens. So Jesus allows them to go into the hogs, but what happens as soon as that happens? They run down a steep place into the sea, and all of them, that's 2,000, drown. That's a bunch of dead hogs in the sea. So let's go on to number four. Jesus calls his fear in those who do not care anything about him. In chapter, in verses 14 to 17. One of the owners of the hog, we don't know where they're owners, they were taking care of them. If you call those who take care of sheep shepherds, why well, you call those who take care of hogs? We don't have a name for that, I don't guess. But the, the ones who take care of the hogs run into the city to say, what happened? Wouldn't you? I would have. You can imagine how this story might have been embellished. You know how it is when you get in a circle, we used to do this as young people, and someone would whisper something in your ear, and then you would pass it and whisper in that person's ear, and by the time it got around, it was totally different, and that's exactly probably what happened. Those in the city, though, were not content with that, so they come out to see what happened, and what they found caused them to want Jesus to leave to leave the area. What did they find? They found the man who had once been possessed, clothed and in his right mind. Now we don't have much detail about that, do we? All we know, Jesus said, come out. They went into the hogs. Other than that, we don't have any information. But what did the townspeople and those in this area experience? Fear. And yes, what is not present in their response? When we read the story, I would have been excited for this man. They're not. They're not. They didn't rejoice at this man's conversion. <laughs> They didn't rejoice that Jesus had found one of his sheep. No, they beg and plead for him to leave. And I had to ask myself, was it because they cared more for the hogs than this man's soul? Probably. What did people say when you were saved? You remember some of those negative remarks? Oh, they're just going through a phase. They went to a revival service, and they got saved. They're just going through a phase. It'll wear off after a while. Give it time. They'll go back to what they were. What if they said that about Saul? Hmm. Did they say that about you? My brother-in-law worked in a Methodist church as a youth pastor when he was in seminary. 
Dallas Seminary is not a Baptist seminary. A lot of Baptists there, but uh, he got a job working with young people. And Bill told me that a young girl was converted, was saved gloriously, and she couldn't wait to tell everybody that she knew what happened. Mm -hmm. She couldn't keep her mouth shut. Oh, for people like that. Yeah. And Bill said, you know, me being Christian a long time, I said these words, he said, I wish I could take them back. The moment I let them out, it'll wear off. I pray it didn't. I pray it doesn't. I pray you never get over being saved. Amen. And I pray that those who marginalize your salvation are now eating their words. I remember the first class reunion that I went to after I was called into the ministry. And it was some years after graduation from high school. Many people found out I was pastoring. Keith Jones is a preacher? Yeah. He is. He still is. And he's still going to be. I remember and Debbie sat beside me in seminary on our, the day that I graduated and I remember Dr. Don Whitney gave the address and he looked at those men and there was around 70 men and some ladies who graduated that day. Some of them went to the doctoral program but Dr. Whitney said these alarming words he said the statistics are that 70% of you will not be in the ministry in 10 years I said to myself I will because I'm determined to do what God wants me to do people marginalize this idea of salvation Oh, so and so got saved. They dumped him in the in the creek or whatever. You know, it'll last a little while. This is one time I think it's okay to make people eat their words. It's okay to say, God said, I told you so. Why did they not rejoice at this man's conversion? A man who went from darkness to light. Well, let's go on. Number five, Jesus commissioned this man to evangelize the region. He didn't even stay there. He didn't leave any of his disciples there. So Jesus agrees to leave. He and the disciples start getting in the boat. What happens? This man comes and says, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. I want to be wherever you are. He could have been the 13th disciple. But Jesus gives him a commission. And this struck me in the heart last night. He gives him a commission. And this is his commission. It's not hard. Go and tell what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Can we not tell the world that? Go to your friends, Jesus said, and tell them. Use your testimony to show the world that Jesus saves. And notice the last three words in verse 20. And all marveled. Is the world marveling at your testimony? Are you telling what great things the Lord has done for you? I pray that we will be so overcome by the Spirit of God that we cannot but tell what he has done for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. What a fascinating story. But Father, if we just concentrate on these details and don't pay any attention to what happened to this man, then we miss what's being said. We, we, we'd be like the townspeople that say, Jesus, we really like you to leave this area. We've never seen anything like this. We're afraid. We would like for you to get back in that boat and go back across the sea. And yes, Father, sometimes the world tells us that. And sometimes Jesus did exactly as they wished. What a horrible thing. To have
have the Lord of glory who created all things on their shore, in their area, and beg and plead for him to leave. Probably this man who was in his right mind is begging for him to stay. Father, I pray you would help us see this story and perhaps put ourselves in the place of this man because perhaps the image of God in us has been disfigured because of what we have done. Lord, it's a simple matter. I love what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 17. This God is not far from any of us. He's just a prayer away. And he will do whatever it takes to glorify himself and restore the image of God in his children. Father, help us be little Christ as we walk around O'Brien, Pawnee County, this area, and perhaps the world. Let's take this message with us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.